Hello and welcome to the Three Books from Hearts and Minds podcast. We are here with a second episode this month. Uh, exciting to debut our every other week scheduling now in bringing you three books from Hearts and Minds to review. I am Philip Schiavone, your co-host and producer from the Coalition for Christian Outreach, transforming college students to transform the world. And of course, with us today, the host with the most to say about books that you should be reading, Byron Borger. Byron, how are you doing today? Well, hello, Phil. I'm doing well. Thank you for the little uh, promo here. We're excited to to do this podcast, and we're grateful for the opportunity to talk about three books from yes, Hearts that's... and Minds for your hearts and minds. <laughs> that's right. And I apparently got the title wrong last time, but we're, we're, we'll get it right. We're, we're going to get going on this. And uh, one thing that I am glad that we got right as a nation is celebrating Juneteenth, which this episode is um, debuting on Juneteenth this year. And it's still a relatively new federal holiday, which I realized uh, I've been alive through two proclamations of holidays. I I think the other one was Labor Day in 83 or something like that. But not many of us actually get to live through the the proclamation of a brand new federal holiday in this country. So I just want to pause and acknowledge that this holiday still might be new to you, right? If if your region or if your workplace, uh, your church, you know, your community hasn't come around to celebrating this yet, that's okay. Uh, But we, uh, with both the CCO and uh, Hearts and Minds books, we are happy to celebrate Juneteenth and recognize this holiday. I wanted to give a really brief summary of it. Juneteenth was the proclamation uh, of the freedom to slaves in Texas two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So it really was the completion of Independence Day for uh, enslaved African Americans in this country, even though the, the proclamation was made two and a half years before, which in the age of tweets breaking news stories and you know automatic email updates and notifications on our phone sounds ridiculous to our current context but that is how the history of it actually played out uh and it's it's impacted me in several ways uh, i i recognize today just in a little bit of research that one of the original aspects of celebrating juneteenth was playing baseball uh, African-American communities would come together and play baseball together to help celebrate. They would take the day off from what they were doing. Baseball, play baseball, uh, baseball fan that you are, Phil. I bet that, yes. that's pretty darn cool. Huh? Huge baseball fan. So I was like, wow, that's amazing. I didn't realize that that was a way of honoring uh, this holiday. And so I'm going to carry this Juneteenth with me a little bit different today, yeah. which that's part of our hope for today is that the books that Byron's going to describe will help you carry Juneteenth a little bit differently going forward as well. So Byron, with that, Can you lead us into the three books that you have? Okay, I'm going to do three books, but you know, I we're I just got to play a little bit with this. I could do 19 books for the ninth to June 19th, but I won't do 19. But I am going to sneak an extra one in there, so we're still calling it three books. But I'll start with this one. It is called On Juneteenth. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. Uh, who won a Pulitzer Prize for a book that she did on the Jefferson family at Monticello. The Hemmings uh, uh, of Monticello, actually, was an American family that she did a major book on, won a Pulitzer Prize, a a Black scholar and historian. And when Juneteenth was being named as a potential holiday for American culture, uh, she wrote this collection of essays. It's a short bit of history, She is from Texas, so it means a whole lot to her. Uh, In the preface, she even says she wasn't sure she wanted the nation to celebrate it because it was such a Texan thing for her. Uh, And Texans are in many ways bellwethers for a lot of what goes on in America if it happens in Texas. So this is a collection of essays that are both historical, a little bit of personal stuff, a little about her own family, a little memoir sort of things. And it's eloquent, it's concise, as you can see, it's short, it's recent, it's by a Pulitzer Prize winning scholar. Her name is Annette Gordon Reed, a hyphenated last name, Gordon Reed. And if you want to pick up one thing on Juneteenth that gives you a succinct sort of overview of the history, the Texan piece, and a Black woman historian describing her own feelings about it all, 
this book really can't be beat. So I want to get to know about that for starters, about the historical book on Juneteenth. So that's just sort of the umbrella title I'll announce in the beginning to get us rolling. So is that good? Yes, that's great. Go ahead. Continue on. All right. I'm going to do three now, our three books from Hearts and Minds. As you might guess, I almost always say, it's funny, almost always when it comes around to this, I often say that one of my favorite publishers is InterVarsity Press, an evangelical Christian publisher with a broad vision, intellectual, thoughtful stuff. It's not cheesy. They never do anything that's that's odd or peculiar. They do really cutting edge books uh, for the Christian community and other broad readers. Well, years and years ago, they did a book called Beyond Liberation. It was an early version of a book by a guy that influenced the CCO quite a bit. Phil, when you were still a kid, Beth and I worked for the CCO staff, and we came to be friends with Carl Ellis. Carl um, was a Black leader, studied at Westminster Theological Seminary under guys like Harvey Kahn, had a holistic, justice-oriented Black view of a book called Beyond Liberation. Well, that book went out of print, and he developed it more and more. It started in a dream that woke him up in the middle of the night, actually, and eventually it became what I think to be one of the very best books on Black history. And so it's not about Juneteenth as such, but if we want to know why Juneteenth is important, we have to know something about both the enslaved people of the 1700s and 1800s, how the Black gospel tradition got started, why anti-abolition, why anti-slavery anti stuff and abolitionists were important, the Underground Railroad, you know, all that sort of stuff. So this is a broad book from an evangelical reformed Christian who I adore, Elward Ellis, or I'm sorry, Carl Ellis, uh, Carl Ellis Jr. And it was recently reissued in what InterVarsity calls um, their signature classics. They've taken some old books and reissued them. They all have uniform covers like this. And it's a book considered a classic in the InterVarsity movement. InterVarsity has always, since the 60s and 70s, done books on racial reconciliation and racial justice. Of the religious publishers out there, they have been the most consistent, the most vocal, and the most, uh, I think, thoughtful of books on racial uh, justice questions since I've been a reader. So kudos to InterVarsity and kudos to, to Carl for doing this free at last question mark. The subtitle is The Gospel in the African American Experience. Uh, Carl, just so you know, was raised um, where he went to a uh, historically black college and, and met Malcolm X. X helped him develop this sense of being a man, of being a black thinker, of the rise of black consciousness. He couldn't go into the black Islam stuff because he was so anti-religious and secularized, had an antagonistic view of religion. So he didn't want to follow Malcolm X entirely, but X, Malcolm X was the guy that got to him first. This would have been about 65, as I recall. Carl then had the opportunity to hear Martin Luther King preach a black gospel preacher that rocked his world. And he began increasingly to realize that maybe his anti-religious sentiments were not uh, the only way to look at things. He met up with Francis Schaeffer and some other white uh, leaders, some then historic black leaders like Tom Skinner that spoke at our Jubilee conferences years ago before he died. And so some of the same trajectory of the CCO developing a sense of multicultural ministry was happening at the same time eventually that Carl was coming into the fore with his leadership uh, within the evangelical world as a black Christian thinker. So he thanks guys like Tom Skinner in the preface, uh, guys like Harvey Kahn, guys like Francis Schaeffer. So he's been around uh, in the reformed world, particularly as a black consciousness leader influenced at first by Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. I mean, I don't know if I know anybody else personally who both heard Malcolm X face-to-face -face in 64 or 5, and then heard Martin Luther King directly as, as Carl did. So he's a hero in my book. This is a book on how the gospel experiences shape the history of African-American people, Juneteenth being one small part of that. So this is a book I want to recommend as much as anything out there. There's so many good books on, on, on Black history and the history of the civil rights movement. I have my favorites just on the civil rights movement, if anybody wants to write and ask me about that. But in terms of Black history for this Juneteenth celebration, I want to say Free at Last by Carl Ellis is the first book I want to tell you about. That's great. Thanks, Byron. I think 
one thing that I really appreciate you sharing there too is that history is dynamic and the fact that Carl Ellis had all these different influences in his life is a reminder to us that when we pick up a book like this, we're we're picking up all of those influences as well, right? And so when we're reading a book by Carl Ellis Jr., we're also reading his life that was impacted by these various voices in this tumultuous time. And yet he's expressing as freedom and the gospel and shaping not only himself, but a people and books give us this magical intersection in that way that uh, sometimes is lost on me. Sometimes I, I think these things, especially from history, it's almost like I tend to read them as like Wikipedia articles. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah, that was that history thing. And I'm gaining some facts about that. No, the, books like this are entirely opposite because they bring about this rich experience of someone that not only had an influence, but was influenced by some really powerful speakers and moments in history. I love talking uh, about books with you, Phil, because you really do have this insight about how the narrative is shaped, how the personal side of things uh, seeps through the lines of the pages. So you're really right on about this. Thanks for sharing that. I'll tell you the second book I want to tell people about. And again, this is a bit of Black history, a Black, uh, a bit of uh, faith-based scholarship around racial reconciliation questions in history. And it's a very brand new book, again, from InterVarsity Press, their academic line, at IBP Academic. It is a book called Awakening to Justice, Faithful Voices from the Abolitionist past. So this is a study of one aspect of the kind of things Juneteenth is honoring, and that's Black history and white allies who were abolitionists in the mid-1800s. Um, this is a fascinating story. It's put out by what they call the Dialogue on Race and Faith Project, which brought together a team of about a dozen multi-ethnic, multi-racial scholars of history to explore something that a historian at a small college in Michigan found, a, a diary and a journal of someone whose name is, I mean, make sure I get this right, um, uh, named David Ingraham. David Ingraham was an 1800s era abolitionist, and they discovered this journal, which was naming all kind of other people, including some Black he was a white guy, black abolitionist that he worked with, namely James Bradley and Nancy Prince, whom I had not heard of. Most people have not. So they got this team of interracial historians to take a couple of years and unpack these unearthed documents and figure out who they were, what they have to say to us today, why it matters, and how to awaken a sleeping church today by using some of what they learned as they studied these kind of rare documents that were uncovered. So this Dialogue on Race and Faith Project is the team that put this together, a uh, book together. It's a collection of essays by a, each historian tackling a certain aspect of these black and white 1800 era, uh, 1800s era folks. Um, they discovered this in 2015. It's been about a decade of them working on this, and the book just came out. Let me just read a section from the back that'll help you kind of understand about this 19th century uh, abolitionist and missionary named David Ingraham. Uh, it says, as they poured over the diary, they realized that studying this document could open new conversations for the 21st century Christians to address the reality of racism today. They invited a multiracial team of 14 scholars to join in and launched the Dialogue on Race and Faith Project. It presents a groundbreaking uh, work of these scholars. And in reflecting on Ingraham's journal, the chapters also explore the life and writings of two of his black colleagues, James Bradley and Nancy Prince. Um, they consider the revivalist movement, the holiness movement that was happening in those years, places like Oberlin College, which were well known in Ohio. Um, it was Charles Finney's form of revivalism and sort of the countercultural interracial communities like were founded at, at Oberlin. You know that Finney would lead these uh, revivals and people would go forward to get saved in the sawdust trail in the evangelical revival type movement. And then right next to where the altar was, where they would receive Jesus, they would sign up to join the uh, abolitionist movement. 
And sometimes if they wouldn't, they would say, go back to the mourner's bench because you have not a serious Christian yet. So when you're ready to sign up for the abolitionist movement, we'll know you're ready to sign up for Jesus and his kingdom. So this is a fascinating period of socially progressive, evangelically holy uh, revivalist in the middle of the 1800s. And this unpacks that stuff really well with a team of 14 different interracial scholars. So I wanted uh, folks to kind of celebrate Juneteenth by digging deep into what was going on, particularly in the evangelical world in Ohio and in the North, as opposed to what was happening in Texas the day Juneteenth became um, unknown and down there. Yeah, great. Thanks, Byron. I, I was taken back to some of my first jubilees and being uh, Jubilee Conference, our, our conference that we hold every February for students and for professionals to learn more about this whole of life vision and how it connects with the gospel. I remember one of the very first things that I was just blown away by was the International Justice Mission and some of their work uh, around this very work. But to realize the impact that we could have in places like northern Ohio, south central Pennsylvania, on the ongoing work of racism and uh, yeah. and freeing slaves. I mean, yeah. we we actually still live in the time where the the most people have ever been enslaved, right? Yeah. And so we, yeah. when we think of abolition as something just in the past, well, then a book like this just becomes a fun treasure to have on a shelf instead of joining a movement no matter where you live, <laughs> right? And that's, that's part of the reason why I'm so happy that we as a country are celebrating Juneteenth because it kind of ushers us into this ongoing movement each year uh, that we celebrate something that has happened in our national past, but yet something that is still a dire need for so many people in the world today. Right again, Phil, you are right on the money. And they say that in this book, that this uh, journey is not over, that this isn't just history, as important as history is, but there's something very lived about this experience. Another thing that they have a chapter on, and here's the role of women in both the abolitionist movement and in the way in which women were abused, particularly enslaved uh, times. And, and again, that's issues today with sexual trafficking and so on. So you're absolutely right. This is as urgent a topic as ever. And uh, gl getting a glimpse of some of the people that were resistant uh, in the 19th century is helpful. I'm going to close up with one more book, and I'll try not to say too much about it, although I really like this book. It is a secular scholar that does mainstream history. Uh, it's a thick historical book about something I had never read about before, and I didn't know anything about this era. Uh, and it's what some people call Reconstruction. The Reconstruction after abolition, after the Civil War, uh, Lincoln freed enslaved people and allowed them to fight in the in the army. And so in the middle of the Civil War, it now becomes a war of liberation for enslaved people and they're enslaved. But, you know, most Southern guys that see that uh, enslaved people, they didn't want to give up their slave. It was their property. And so they were fighting and killing over this. They weren't going to let this happen. So how did that actually happen where enslaved people actually were let go while the war was still going on? And then once the war uh, was over and Appomattox happened and Robert E. Lee rather uh, graciously surrendered at that moment, well, the people in the South weren't having it. And people in Texas weren't having it. So it is not only that it took two years for the word to get to Texas. That's sort of part of it. You alluded to our quick paced, fast cell phone emails today. It wasn't just that they were slow. The Pony Express could have gotten there in a day or two. It's that they weren't having it. They were not agreeing that the war was over and the wars continued. Battles continued during the early days of reconstruction and there were massacres. But freed black people would have gatherings, even church services and Confederates that were now no longer a Confederate army, but more like guerrillas would massacre them in places like New Orleans, famously like the massacre outside of Memphis. There were these literal battles that continued after the Civil War. Civil War buffs, I guess, know this, but I live no close to Gettysburg. You do, too. So we know all about the middle of the Civil War. I didn't know what the heck happened as the war and the proclamation of emancipation began to keep become known. Uh, and what this book does, he's a Texas scholar, uh, teaches history in Austin. He looks particularly at what happened in Texas. So this is really germane for the Juneteenth celebration. It is called Civil War by Other Means, America's Long and unfinished 
fight for democracy. He does not make too many direct links to the raging attacks um, on the Capitol in January 6th, two years ago. But the implication is there that the rebels who are still fighting for their Confederate flags are still loose in our world, and we have to be aware of that. So again, this is not just mere history, but it's asking how groups of people that don't want one nation under God, that do not want one nation for everybody equal, uh, are still fighting and attacking and doing their worst to be rebels against this great United States. I didn't know this, Phil, maybe you knew this, but I didn't know this, that a bunch of the Confederate leaders, you wonder what happened to them all, um, went to Mexico and they intended to restart the war again. They were kind of getting themselves retrained, refiguring their militias, how many soldiers they had, who was going to lead what, who the new generals were going to be, because Lee surrendered. And so they were recapitulating the rebel army in Mexico in the mid-1800s, in the mid-1860s. And they lived in Mexico for a couple of years. So I had no idea about any of this. This civil war by other means shows how a Juneteenth uh, was a great victory for enslaved people, and it finally got to Texas. But at that time in Texas, there was all kind of horrific stuff still going on. This is riveting history. I never knew anything about any of this, and it was really striking. I'm just going to read to the back uh, to close here. Uh, Peniel Joseph, who wrote The Third Reconstruction, a really important African-American scholar, says a riveting, page-turning, epic tour de force that is as timely as it is insightful. Jeremy Suri, S-U-R-I, that's the author. Jeremy Suri brilliantly contextualizes the roots of contemporary racial and political divisions that culminated in the January 6th assault on the Capitol by taking us back to the crucial two decades after the Civil War's formal end. This passionate, wide-ranging, and engaging history is a must-read for all those interested in the future of American democracy. David Kennedy is an emeritus historian at a Stanford history, at Stanford University, says no previous scholar has written about the post-Civil War decades with more brio, passion, and outrage than Suri. Civil War, by other means, scathingly documents the grotesque persistence of violent white supremacism in the not-quite-conquered South, as well as the growing indifferent in the victorious North to the plight of the newly freed black citizens. It is a blistering good read, a sobering lesson on the toxic stubbornness of American racism. That's a mouthful, that's heavy stuff, but if we wanna celebrate Juneteenth well, we can't just say we're glad the Texans finally got the word. We gotta struggle with what was going on there and the ongoing implication of white supremacy in our own time and this History, I think, will help give us a good foundation for being agents of God's uh, reconciliation and justice as we move forward. So happy Juneteenth. Happy day celebrating it as Americans. We're glad for this. But I wanted to name a couple of books that are going to help flesh it out as we continue to be people that celebrate that good news. Yeah, thanks so much, Byron. Uh, that, that last book is yet another reminder of how we learn and how we educate ourselves on these sort of topics. You're right. Gettysburg is just over the hill from me and you know, right down Route 30 from you. And it's easy to think of some of these historical things in commercial terms, commercialized terms, like go to a Gettysburg tour. And yes, you know, and there's something to that and sure, importance sure. to that. There's yeah. also just consuming what we do through the media and through news and social media. But then there are books like this that really help us understand the context of current events and where they are going if left unchecked and a call to action, you know, not just education, but a call to action on yeah. the part of the kingdom of God. And so, yeah, I really appreciate not that last book recommendation as well as these other books. Anything else on your end, Byron, for Juneteenth or otherwise? Um, I'm just glad to have an opportunity to talk about these things now. And we're really uh, grateful for the CCO helping us do this podcast, letting people know some books that we have here at Hearts and Minds. Yeah, thanks, Byron. It's great to, to get this. We're, we're podcasting every other week now, so we're excited to bring you even more books. 
uh, to consider purchasing. To We want to thank you for listening, but we would also encourage you to purchase these books or any other books that you have on your mind to read. And to place an order, you can click on the very first link in the episode description. Make sure to like and share the episodes, no matter how you're listening to it, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Our contact information for either one of us or both of us, uh, if you'd like to send those emails, are in the description below as well. And, of course, read these books. We want to know what not only that you're reading them, but what you think of them. So feel free to send us your feedback on any of these books. So, on behalf of Byron and Hearts and Minds, as, as well as myself and the CCO, this has been another episode of the Three Books from Hearts and Minds podcast. <laughs>